the likelihood of such a vaccine reaching different parts of the world uh, before the middle of next year is rather low. It should have been recognized that in indoor spaces where the air circulation is low, uh, there is the risk of aerosol formation which can hang around for some hours. Dr. Reddy, thank you so much for joining us. I want to start by asking you uh, a question that's on top of mind for a lot of people, which is uh, the WHO finally acknowledging that the coronavirus can possibly be uh, airborne. Now, my question is two parts. My first question is, why is there been such a reluctance on part of uh, World Health Organization and other scientific bodies to acknowledge this evidence, which has been there for a while? Well, uh, this particular debate has been on for about three months or so, particularly with some high-resolution photographs in closed spaces uh, demonstrating the formation of aerosols. But based on the experience from the previous SARS-CoV-1 virus, it was felt that essentially the spread is through droplets. But uh, recognizing that uh, SARS-CoV-1 mainly was affecting the lungs and the this particular virus, apart from spreading throughout the body, even in the respiratory tract, has a considerable presence in the nose, the throat, and the sinuses, and can discharge itself easily on loud speaking or singing or shouting. Uh, it should have been recognized that in indoor spaces where the air circulation is low, uh, there is the risk of aerosol formation, which can hang around for some hours. And that has been demonstrated now fairly clearly also in the episodes that have broken out in uh, bars and nightclubs and uh, entertainment places or even restaurants uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, the fact that this is also being linked to what are called super spreader events in these closed spaces has lent weight to the evidence and therefore the conclusion is now inescapable. Policy decisions made by WHO impact policies that the countries adapt uh, going forward and, uh, you know, as we've unlocked and we are talking about opening businesses and schools and, uh, you know, uh, offices, how would that impact the uh, policy decisions? Well, some of the policy measures that have already been prescribed <laughs> under the assumption that the main route of spread is droplet infection still remain very valid. Uh, masks, physical distancing and hand washing remain very valid. But one thing that needs to be added now is that try and maintain as much open ventilation as possible. Whether it is schools and houses, try and have the windows open if you can. But if your office architecture cannot be changed or the school architecture can't be changed, of course, you must continue to wear masks there as well. That's very important. But try and keep the airflow as much as possible so that the viruses do not congregate into aerosols. Okay, I wanted to uh, discuss certain terminology with you that is uh, used when we talk about uh, COVID progress of any country. In uh, India, we've been talking a lot about the case uh, fatality ratio, and uh, there have been, what, 20,000 deaths in India so far uh, related to COVID uh, in comparison to over 100,000 in the US and in Brazil. Uh, I wanted to understand, A, if you could just explain briefly what this means and uh, how reliable is this number? Firstly, when we interpret any number, whether it's cases or deaths, one has to look at the denominator as well. Uh, if you look at 20,000 cases, it's certainly frightening and any death is a death too many. Uh, however, when you actually start comparing countries or comparing even periods of time, where was India in March, where was India in uh, April and where is India now? You also have to divide the number of deaths with the number with the population size. So for deaths per million becomes very important. And if you take deaths per million, certainly compared to March, we are certainly not well off at the moment. We must recognize that even these deaths will have to be age standardized, adjusted for the age. And then we will have to really also compare the countries accordingly. But we have to take all the measures to prevent the virus from spreading to the areas where it's very active now to areas where it is far less active. Like, for example, in uh, Bihar, Eastern UP, several parts of the Northeast other than Assam, uh, much of our rural areas, 
the virus is still not very active. Therefore, our responsibility is to prevent the virus from spreading and in, in infecting those places and resulting in larger number of deaths. Uh, the other indicator that's uh, spoken about is positivity rate. And uh, India has been in the range of six to seven, uh, six to nine percent. Anything above ten means uh, the infection is uh, growing at a higher pace, and the tests that are available. If you could just explain what positivity rate means. Well, uh, if we can actually look at the positivity rate of tests as they're being done in terms of the number of cases being diagnosed as positive, as opposed to the number of tests being done on a daily basis. I emphasize daily basis with standardized criteria of testing and also standardized combination of testing methods, then it's very important. Antigen tests give more false negative tests than RT-PCR tests. So suddenly if you're bringing in large number of antigen tests and say that the positivity rate has come down, that doesn't always carry conviction. On the other hand, if your ratio of antigen tests so the RT-PCR test is standardized over a period of time. And if your cases are still coming down in terms of positivity rate, then that's very encouraging. And uh, finally, recovery rate. Um, you know, the government is saying India's recovery rate is higher than the global average. Uh, you know, I mean, I, the fatality rate is somewhere between 3 to 4% globally, right? Uh, so, I mean, you do know that 98, 97% of people will recover. Is this a figure that should even be discussed? I mean, is that is that significant at all? No, I think basically uh, what the government is really doing is like reporting from a fire station. They're saying, okay, how many fires have been put out and how many more fresh fires are breaking out in the city, right? So from that point of view, they are really trying to say that we are not getting into serious trouble with larger fires breaking out elsewhere or the fires spreading widely. So we are basically uh, relying on the fact that large parts of India are not throwing up many more new cases and the active cases that are there are recovering in general. But if it is being conveyed as a message that only 60% or 70% of the cases are recovering, then the public will feel anxious because we know that more than 96 to 97% of the cases will recover. Uh, uh, some of them will recover fully. Some of them may have a few sequelae for some months or so. So essentially, I think our recovery rate should not be shown as a sign of progress because it's a cumulative rate. As the epidemic advances, the recovery rate will mount in virtually every country. On the other hand, if you show it as saying, look, we are not getting too many new cases elsewhere which are active and yet to recover, whereas our cases which were active are now recovering, that's a more positive messaging. You know, I mean, there's obviously enough said about uh, the Indian vaccine and the deadline of 15th August. I don't want to go back to it, but I, realistically, when do you when do you see a vaccine uh, a, a vaccine uh, that's ready for public health use? Well, we need a vaccine which is both safe and efficacious. And if those tests are passed, then we we need a vaccine which can be quickly produced in large enough quantity to meet the global demand and at an affordable cost. So in terms of passing the scientific tests of various stages of clinical trials, various phases as they are called, by the time we actually see the phase three being completed through a large randomized clinical trial, it will probably be at least the end of the year by the time the results come out. Then it has to go into the production chain and then into the supply chain, both of which are going to require intense efforts and investment to make sure that the processes can be speeded up. So the likelihood of such a vaccine reaching different parts of the world uh, before the middle of next year is rather low. Uh, however, India may be in an advantageous situation in if, if our vaccines, that those which we are producing, are proven to be safe and efficacious. And therefore, we do have a very good uh, a production engine within in the country itself for ramping up the production and distribution of these vaccines. 
So we may be better off if our vaccines are shown to be effective. But if there are other vaccines produced elsewhere in the world which are shown to be effective and they come out earlier, then we'll have to depend upon the dynamics of supply chain and production chains uh, in order to be able to access the vaccine. So I would say having access to vaccine in a year is optimistic. If it does come earlier than that, that is definitely a cause for celebration. My next question is, you know, I mean, it, there, there was obviously a lot of concern when India reached uh, in like a month and a half from 10th position to the third position in terms of number of cases. Now, what strategies should we adopt uh, to prevent us from going to number two and number one? Um, and these strategies will have to be different for different parts of the country, but also at community levels, at local, like local governance levels. What are the strategies that we need to very actively start right now? Well, uh, as I said, uh, the infection will actually have different stages of the epidemic in different parts of the country. Therefore, when people ask me, when is it going to peak? I say, think of it as like a mountain range or a, a range of Western Ghats or Eastern Ghats. You're not going to have a single hill or a single mountain. You're going to have different hill spread. But having said that, most important thing is public health measures, which are personal protection measures like care, but also issues like how are we really going to identify cases quickly, isolate them, trace the contacts, and also isolate them. And for this, we need syndromic surveillance based on symptoms of influenza-like illness or COVID-like illness. You need to have primary health care teams and even citizen volunteers visiting houses on a weekly basis. A cluster of houses can be allocated to these teams, and if we find out who is actually having an infection, very early identification and early testing and isolation of uh, the person and the contacts uh, in the house, but also active tracing of other contacts whom the person might have been exposed to or who has actually uh, been exposed by the index case of the person. So that is very important if we want to really curtail the spread of the infection. And this has to be done on a countrywide basis in a very organized fashion. It has been estimated by a recent McKinsey report, which is just coming out, that 70% of the actual impact would come from these kind of prevention measures, even before a case has sought clinical attention. But the level of economic activity can be triaged according to the uh, situation. Like, for example, in rural areas, farming was taken up early and even other activities can be taken up where the risk is currently low, as long as you observe all the other precautions and try and contain the spread of the virus from urban to rural areas.